Hello and welcome in the church house in Nizel in the Netherlands. My name is Sietse de Vries. I'm a professional organist and church musician. And I would like to share some thoughts with you about improvising in particular. And let's start with some introductions because I'm in a special place here. It's actually a little church that I live in. So it's probably not a bad idea to first have a little look around and then I will give you some ideas about my philosophy of improvising. Then we listen to a short improvisation and then at the end I will tell you some more about my ways of teaching. But let's have a look around first. So let's start with the mother of all keyboard instruments, the clavichord. And as you can see, I also like to collect books, most of them about organs, about composers, about music in general. Then you see a little reed organ, a harmonium. It's so small you can take it anywhere and sometimes that can come in very handy. Then you see a virginal in the corner at the west side of the church, a beautiful Scottish chamber organ from the 19th century, a grand piano, and then my pride and joy, a really beautiful hill and sun organ with great swell and pedal, originally built in 1874 for a mansion near Liverpool. And although it's small, you can play a huge amount of romantic repertoire on it. Then an organ in Renaissance style with 12 stops. Of course, a one fourth comma mean tone temperament. Then we have the entrance of the church and you see some beautiful paintings made by the famous Dutch painter Henk Helmantel. There is a a very nice harpsichord, a copy after Mietke, built by Cornelis Bom. Then a nice regal, a copy after an instrument of the 17th century. Another harpsichord, a two manual that needs a lot of work actually. Then you can see at the east end of the church two more reed organs. On the left hand side, uh, English harmonium. Holt Birmingham and on the right hand side uh, French Alexandre and then the pièce de résistance at the east end of the church you have this wonderful organ case that was built originally in 1906 by Martin Eertman a local organ builder um, it looks beautiful but actually inside was not a very interesting organ so it has been completely rebuilt and now there is a 22 stop baroque organ inside and we're still in the works of voicing it. So it's a really nice building with a beautiful collection of instruments so I'm very happy to live here as you can imagine. So the topic of improvising. Um, that's actually quite an interesting topic because there are so many different ideas and opinions about it. Of course, it basically means that you make music without a score, that you come up with the ideas on the spot. And that's correct, of course. But the crazy thing is that a lot of people nowadays think that you have literature playing and that you have improvising. And it's something that is completely set apart from that. So it's only for the people that have kind of a crazy brain or uh, are for some reason interested in it. But the normal way of playing is with scores and then you have a little extra which is called improvising. And of course when you would ask that anyone in earlier days, let's say a César Franck in the 19th century or a Bach in the 18th century or other uh, older composers in the Renaissance period, they would probably look at you like, what are you talking about? Um, improvisation is not a special trait that you do as a little extra, it's just part of music making. And once you approach it like that, then suddenly it becomes much more clear what improvisation actually is. 
And I think the main way of thinking about it is that you realize that all the old composers until the, well, basically until the beginning of the 20th century, um, composers were not just composers. They could also play an instrument, they could improvise on their instrument. So the whole idea that we have nowadays to separate all those special things is not at all historic. I think if you would encounter Mozart uh, and you would ask him, are you a composer? He would probably say, I'm a musician. That means he could play the piano, he could play the violin, he could of course compose, but he could also make music on the spot. He could play music from others. The whole package, including theory of course, was uh, embedded in the idea that you are a musician. Nowadays, in our way of teaching, we separated everything. So you can have special classes for your main instrument, where you work a lot on technique probably. Um, then you have special classes for theory. If you want, you can follow a special class for composing, and maybe you can even have a special class for improvising. But I think the first step to think about it is to have the idea that it is really incorporated in being a musician. Well, how did it start for me? I always improvised and I actually ha had to work my way back to realize why it actually is that I like to improvise and that I can actually do it. And it was already in my days at the conservatory when I was a student that I realized I'm actually one of the few that improvises. Why is that? And then it really struck me after a lot of thinking and talking about it and reading up about it, of course, that it is actually ridiculously simple. It has very little to do with talent or a special ability or something like that. The whole thing comes down to how do you start playing an instrument? And of course, in earlier days, let's say in the Baroque period, it was very simple. You grew up probably in a family of musicians. So from early childhood on, actually from baby on, you would listen to music, you would hear music all the time, you would start copying things, like you just would sing a melody if you knew it, and after singing you could probably try an instrument that was lying around or standing around, and in a very natural way you actually started to make music. And that's the essence of things, because what I told you just now is exactly the same process as how we learn to talk. So in your own native language, you can improvise. You can have a thought and you can clearly articulate what your thought is. You can discuss it with others. So it's very simple to express whatever feeling or thought you have in talking in your native language. How did you learn your native language? Exactly what I just told you. You started from baby on to listen, that's step one. Then you start to copy, first small words, then little sentences. And after a while, you're capable of speaking that language and communicate. And only after that, you start reading and writing. That makes complete sense. That's what we all do. Now, what do we do in music? We actually all start with reading. And that's actually where the big mistake is. Uh, it seems so easy because you have a method, you have a little book, you put it in front of a kid and you tell the, the, the student, okay, if you see this little sign, you press that key or well, whatever instrument, it applies to all instruments, of course, um, you make a sound on the instrument. So what you basically learn is you look at something, this symbol tells you what to do and after you've done this, the result is there's sound. But you've no idea what the sound is. It has no meaning to you. And you probably all know that feeling, especially in childhood. You were doing lots of exercises and playing songs that didn't have any meaning to you. And that's where it all goes wrong, because it's all from the outside imported. So you just do things that don't have any intrinsic meaning to you. And of course, then you can't improvise, because you never learned to speak your own mind, so to say. And that's, of course, the important thing. You start like speaking. And uh, I'm a parent myself of two young kids, and then you know actually what it is to teach the uh, natural way. If your kid starts talking, you know as a parent exactly what should be the next word or the next sentence. So that's fully natural. It should be the same in music. So let's say um, a child, eight or seven years old, wants to play the piano or an organ, and you ask the child, can you sing a song? 
and hopefully the child can sing because that's a problem nowadays. A lot of children don't sing anymore and they don't learn it in school anymore. But that's step one, you should sing. And once you can sing a little melody, now you can translate it to the instrument because it's intrinsic. It's already in the child. It's already in his or her brain. She knows how to sing it. And now we can try it on the instrument. And in a very playful manner, you get to know the instrument. Uh, in case of an organ or a piano, you get to know the keyboard. Uh, this sound, this C, is the same as this C or this C, but it gets higher. And this way it gets lower. And now if I hear that the melody goes up, I know I have to go in that direction. And I just try and I listen all the time. And this combination of having an intrinsic motivation, having a song that you know, and then trying the instrument, that actually makes that you learn to play the instrument in a very natural way. And of course, there is a part that you can't learn when it comes to improvising, and that's the creative part. And we all know that. You have uh, the same in a language. Some people can talk for hours very eloquently, and some people just stick to short sentences. But both can actually learn to master the language. And with this word, master, I actually come to the core business of how to learn improvising. It's all about control. You need to master things. You can only speak a language when you know the words, when you know the meaning of the words, when you can make good sentences, so you have to know the grammar of the language. And once you have control over that, then you can speak your mind completely freely. And again, if you compare it to speaking another language, like I'm talking English now, when I started talking English and I knew only like 50 or 100 words, I had a hard time communicating because I only controlled a very small portion of the language, so I couldn't really speak my mind. When you do it a lot and you get a greater vocabulary and you know more about the language, you practice a lot, then you can actually speak your mind. And again, Talking is actually the same as improvising, delivering a little speech like I do now. is exactly the same process in your mind as improvising. So this is the main thing when it comes to improvising, the main philosophy. You learn it like a language. You preferably start at a very young age, not with a method, but with listening and understanding and making music. After a while, of course, you can add some music theory, you can add the notes, and score reading actually comes in like in a language. Once you can speak the language at a certain level, in a very natural way, you start reading and writing. So that's very important. So the good news is when you start young and you start the right way, everyone can improvise. The bad news is, of course, how do you start when you are already an accomplished organist? Well, it's still possible. Because, like I said, you can learn another language too. I can speak English now. So I learned that at a later age. The thing is, I will probably never be able to speak language, the language of English at the same level as my native language, Dutch. But still, I can learn it at a pretty high level when I want to. I just have to practice it a lot and know a lot about the language. So the same for improvising. When you start later, you can still learn it at a very high level, actually. But it requires really starting from the very beginning, the small words, the small sentences, control all the time, and then you build up your language. And of course, for the one that's easier than for the other. And the big difference here with a language is that a lot of people, when you can already play a lot of literature, you actually know what the language sounds like at the highest level. You can play all these wonderful composers, this wonderful music. And now you have to improvise and you have to start at this very basic level. And to bridge that gap between very essential basic level and going to the level of the great composers, that takes a long time, of course. And uh, that's the downside when you are already a good organ student. It will take a lot of time and effort and a lot of patience. So a lot of people decide, okay, I can play these wonderful pieces. Why bother to improvise? But once you can do it and you start improvising and you get at a higher and higher level, you will notice that it's the most wonderful thing there is. And it actually gives you a lot of understanding of literature as well, because you start playing literature in a different way. When I play a piece of Bach, I want to know what he's doing. What's that wonderful chord? How did he get from this key to this key? And a lot of things that you normally learn from a teacher or that you learn by listening to others about articulation, tempo, registration, 
they become also more intrinsic because you know what you are listening for, you know what you are playing, you understand the music, and then it's actually very hard to form an opinion how you want to play it. So it also gives you a lot as a literature player. All right, let's listen to a little improvisation. It's um, an improvisation I did uh, last summer in the Martinikerk Groningen, where I'm the organist. I always call this organ the Green Monster. It's one of the best organs in the world, I still think. Um, I played a piece that is, uh, the start is from Bach. He wrote 12 bars of a little Fantasia in C major. And I decided to complete the piece uh, as an improvisation. And I added a little fugue as well. So it's a live performance from a concert. And then I come back to you to talk a little bit about the method of teaching. Enjoy!
So I hope you enjoyed that wonderful organ and keep in mind Groningen and Groningen is both the name of the capital city of the province but it's also the name of the province itself. It's in the north of the Netherlands and this whole province and it's small but it's packed with wonderful little villages with wonderful organs. So we have easily 50 beautiful historic organs that you can just visit by riding your bike. Uh, the oldest instruments go back to the late Gothic times. We have a lot of Renaissance organs in mean tone temperament. We have a lot of Baroque organs, of course, a lot of famous uh, organs of Arp Schnitke, who built a lot of organs around the 1700s here. Um, so yeah, you can really visit here when you want to and play all these wonderful instruments. So I can only encourage you, please come here and uh, you can have a little organ trip with an organ class, for example, for a week. Or you can also study here at the Conservatory of Groningen, where I am one of the teachers. So back on track, improvisation. How can you actually learn it? Well, I already told you in the beginning, when you start as a small child, you want to learn the basics. What is actually the basics of a keyboard instrument when you think about it? Well, the whole keyboard is designed in a way that you can just put your fingers on it and play a triad. Because that's actually the main feature of a keyboard instrument, you can play chords. That's what it is designed to do. So you start always with chords, a triad, let's say a triad of C. And already with small kits, you can invert it so that you can play it in different ways. And that not only brings you some idea of what a triad sounds like and what you can do with it, but it also brings already a muscle memory, how to play chords. And even more important, it brings a lot of understanding of the instrument. You probably remember when you played from a method, you start like in the middle of the manual and then after a few months when uh, you get different exercises, suddenly your hands are here and it felt more difficult, let alone if you have to do something like this. Um, and of course the playing is not more difficult, only the reading is different and more difficult. And if you learn from the beginning that it's always the same keys you encounter, that you only have one octave and the rest is just repetition, a kid already understands that it is actually very simple, the keyboard. The same for sharps and flats. It's really silly that we learn them from a book and whenever a new sharp or flat appears, it feels like it's more difficult. So when we encounter a piece of César Franck with a lot of uh, flats or sharps, we think this is difficult. And of course it's not true. If I play, let's say, a triad of F sharp, those three black keys are as easy uh, to play as the triad of C major with all white keys. It really is no difference. So uh, we always make it difficult by reading all the time, but the playing in whatever key is of course not more difficult at all. So that's how it starts. Uh, how can you make triads? After a while, you of course, when you know different triads like C, F and G, then you have a good start to really harmonize some little songs. Because once you can play, and I call it the 1-4-5 system, so you have the tonic, the subdominant and the dominant, and you can play those triads with all the inversions, now you can actually play a song with a melody on top and you just have the inverted triads underneath so that you can harmonize your own song. In the beginning I'm always very strict that I make sure that the right hand is playing the triad with the melody on top, the left hand is only playing the bass notes, so the tonic, subdominant and dominant. And again it's all about control. If you control this completely, that you know what you're doing, you know exactly what triad you're playing, what inversion you're playing, then you can actually do it in whatever key. So that could be a next step, have fun in whatever key you like, and you play the same songs that you know in D major, in G major, in F major, in B flat major, and uh, if the kid likes it, why not in F sharp major, because it feels exactly the same, of course, to play. So that's a good start. I always use songs, so uh, again the singing of songs, the knowing of melodies is very important. I'm always a bit uh, envious of people like Bach, uh, who lived in a period that every kid probably knew like 30 church hymns by heart, because they sung them every day. And nowadays you're lucky if a kid knows a few songs. So if the kid doesn't sing at all and doesn't know any songs, that's actually where you have to start. Uh, get them to learn some melodies, 
And preferably, when you want to be an organist, learn some of the famous church melodies. Ein Vesterburg ist unser Gott, allein Gott in der Höhe sei er. All the famous Lutheran hymns that you encounter all the time when you play music of Buxtehude, of Bach and others. So that's a good way to start and also to broaden the knowledge of a kid. What actually, uh, where does this music come from? In the Netherlands, uh, we have a complete secular country, so almost no one goes to church. So you actually need to educate organ students about what it is to play the organ and where this music comes from. If you have no knowledge about liturgy anymore, what they do in church services and how they sung these songs, then it's very silly to play a wonderful choral prelude of Bach and you have no idea what it actually is. Then it's just a nice piece of music that you can play anywhere. Of course, there's more to it. The same actually, the, the broadening of knowledge goes for how to use the organ. I always try to give my lessons on nice pipe organs uh, and then you can actually encounter the different sounds. So from early childhood on you can already learn what's a principle, what's a flute, uh, why uh, has the sesquialtra this funny name and what is it actually. So from childhood on you get to experiment and to get to know the organ. Once you can harmonize in a simple way, you can also explore the very typical things of an organ, like playing the melody with one hand on a solo stop on the first manual, for example, accompanying with the other two voices of the triad on the second manual with a softer sound, and now you can use the pedal to play the tonic, subdominant and dominant. So uh, even small kids, they love to play the pedal, so why not incorporate it right from the beginning when they can reach it, of course, that's an uh, important thing. So that way you can really explore the organ, explore different kinds of music making, and whenever creativity kicks in with a few ornaments, you change the rhythm, you play it in different keys, uh, and whatever the kid comes up with to do something nice or funny with the melody, allow it to happen, because that's important. Creativity is the only thing you can't learn, so when it's there, always encourage it, encourage it that you can do beautiful things. Well, and from here you develop further and further, and also when you work with students that are older or already can improvise a little bit, the main thing is that you start at where the student is at that moment. So first you have to discover, okay, what can this child or student already do? You have to check if there's real control, because that happens all the time, that people can quasi-improvise some things, but then when you ask about it, what are you actually doing? Can you play it in a different key? Can you play it in a different way? And then suddenly you discover there is some knowledge, but not complete control. And that's actually important to notice, the control, without the control, you can't make any steps further, because it will always be kind of okay. Um, and if I explain to you how the brain works, it makes it completely clear. Always when you encounter something new that you want to learn, your brain has to work very hard in the beginning. And we all know that. It's the same when you learn a new piece of music. You really have to focus, you have to read, you have to listen, you have to understand the thing what you're doing. If you have done it like 10 times, 20 times or 100 times, your brain tells you, okay, I'm on standby, I know this. What happens actually is that it goes from your, let's say, working memory, in computer terms, it goes to the hard drive. Um, I really love the English word embodiment. It's actually in your body. You can just do it without thinking. That means first you practice very hard on something. Let's say a kid starts with the triads, inversions in different ways. In the beginning you really have to think about it, it's difficult. And after a while your muscle memory kicks in and your brain tells you, I know how to do this, I don't have to think about it anymore. That's the moment when you start a new step. And that goes for all the levels that you have. Also when you can make little choral preludes or you want to go more in the direction of uh, polyphonic music. It's always about taking one step at a time, control that step completely until you notice that your brain is basically on standby. Then you take the next step. And talking about polyphony, that's probably a nice way to end. Of course you can get to any level you want but you have to do it in steps. So first step is harmonize 
really well, that you can harmonize in many different ways and you always combine it with the music theory. This, so after you can uh, do it with very simple chords, the one, four, five system, you can add the other triads, so the two, the three, the six, which are uh, minor triads, of course, when you go from a major scale. Um, you can add diminished chords, you can add dominant seven chords, you can add secondary dominance. Whatever you can learn in music theory, apply it to your harmonizing. And if you can harmonize really well, then you can go to the next step to, for example, leave out one voice. So start harmonizing with three instead of four voices. And now we have suddenly something new. You have to think about voicing. Where do actually all these voices go? So I call that always going from vertical thinking in chords to more horizontal thinking, that you actually uh, get to notice that every voice does something interesting. And that's of course the road to go to more polyphonic thinking. But that's a long road actually. And the same goes for going from a very close harmony to a more wide harmony that you uh, um, distributed over uh, two hands, the chords, and that you can play them in many different ways. But those are all elements that you can learn step by step. That's the good news. And if you really devote yourself to it, to go through all these steps, then you have a very good basics to uh, improvise. And you will see that you can actually make wonderful music very easily. And it's up to you at what level you want to go and how far you will take it. And in my case, I'm still learning every day. Once you get hooked on improvising, Whatever piece you play, whatever organ you play, whatever book you read, it will give you some new insights and some new information and some new stimulants to go further with uh, improvising and to make it even more beautiful and more interesting. And to close with the same idea as I started, I think that is actually what it is to be a real musician like the old masters. It's all about incorporating everything. In the end, it's all about making beautiful art and to make not only your life but especially the life of others a bit more beautiful and special. Well I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed certainly to make this video and uh, again I like to invite you whenever you want uh, to come over and to visit some beautiful organs in Groningen. Goodbye. <laughs>